Good morning, Community Church. It's great to have you here today. My name is Alan Cleveland, and I'm the senior pastor of Community. And it's good to be able to welcome you wherever you're watching us from, wherever you're engaging in worship uh, this day. This is Pentecost Sunday, which marks the day uh, of the birth of the church, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on those men and women, boys and girls, who were gathered together in Jerusalem so many years ago. Uh, to see what God was going to do next. And indeed, over those next few years, God worked and moved through them in powerful ways and through successive generations to our day today. And so it's great to be able uh, to come together and worship our God with you because he is at work today in us as we keep our eyes open and we keep our hearts soft and sensitive and ready to respond as he calls us. Well, hey, this morning we are continuing in our series, Asking for a Friend. And that is asking those questions that, well, may be a little bit awkward to ask. And uh, they're really reflective of our hearts, a question that maybe we're wrestling with. And so the question for today is simply this, is church essential? Is church essential? Now, given the current situation we find ourselves in with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, that, that question has a lot more implications that I care to get into this morning from that angle. But it is a question that's been asked for years and years and years by many people. Well, indeed, even people who would declare themselves to be followers of Jesus Christ, maybe you yourself, has asked that question, is the church really essential in terms of my relationship with God? Oh, well, certainly there are reasons why uh, that question has been asked, and maybe reasons you have to ask that question. Certainly we can look back at church history, and we see that there are many moments uh, when it's not stellar, you think of the Crusades, or you think of the churches in the South in the days leading up to the Civil War, or even after, uh, not just in the South, but in the North, where racism and other forms of bigotry were uh, tolerated. Uh, and so, yeah, the, you look at the history of the church, and it has not always been uh, that exemplary. But then also, there's another dynamic. Maybe it's that sense of personal uh, disappointment that you've experienced, uh, hurt and, or pain, and, and that stirs up those questions. And it's, and it's easier, it's protective to pull away. And, and so the question might be rumbling around in your heart and head this morning, is church essential? Well, maybe you've heard that expression that goes uh, uh, just like this. He is so heavenly-minded, he's no earthly good. Well, that's certainly not a compliment. Does it? it doesn't sound like one, does it? But basically what it's saying is somebody's walking around with their head maybe so high in the sky that their feet aren't quite grounded in reality, in real life. And that can apply to a person, and maybe at times that can apply to the church because as we look at the history of the church and maybe your own experience with the church, there have been those moments where it seems that uh, the church's agenda is not quite in touch with reality. Well, that is certainly not what is reflected in God's word. That is certainly not what God calls his people to do. Uh, I, I think the reason why there is that perception is that churches are not as heavenly minded as they need to be, not as God focused, as Jesus centered, as spirit driven as they need to be. And so, subsequently, that's why we have these moments where the people who claim to be people of God don't always act that way. Uh, the word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia. And if you were to break that word apart, uh, oh, just to its very basic foundation, it means those who've been called out or called out. Now, by the time of the New Testament, it gained the meaning of, of being an assembly, a gathering of people who've gathered together for a purpose. And, and as we read God's word, 
uh, especially as we get into the letters of Paul in the, in the part of the later part of the New Testament, we see that the church are those people who are assembled together, gathered together for a purpose, and that is to worship and honor and glorify God in all that they say, in all that they do. As a matter of fact, we see the call of God upon the people of God uh, throughout Scripture. And there's any number of ways to frame this, any number of uh, times we can point to where God called his people uh, to perform in a certain way. That is, uh, to enact his grace in interacting with the world around them. Uh, for example, I, I've just picked three of them for this morning for us to take a look at, for us to consider that God's people are called to bless. Oh, we go back to Genesis chapter 12, and, and when God appeared to Abram, later Abraham, the father of many, now he appears to Abram, that means father, and he says, I am going to bless you so that you might be a blessing to the nations. Well, this is what he says. I will make you of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Well, we can track that theme uh, through the Old Testament, uh, even to the point in Jeremiah, where Jeremiah, a prophet to the people of Israel, calling people back to faithful relationship with God. He's actually writing to people in exile. And to these exiles in a foreign country, in the nation of, in the country of Babylon, in the city of Babylon, he writes these words. Now remember, they're in exile. They're not where they want to be. They're far from their home. They're, they're certainly not happy there. They want to be home. They want to be in Israel. They want to be in Jerusalem. But at this point, they're in Babylon. And, and this is what he says. Uh, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. And he goes on from there down to verse 7 of Jeremiah 29, where he says, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Now, what's interesting in this prayer is that word welfare is that word shalom. And when we hear that word shalom, we think of the word peace. And indeed, that's what it means. But it's not just limited to peace as the absence of conflict. Like there's no fighting, so there's peace. No, it's a, there's a wholeness to it. There's a blessedness to it. There's a completeness to it. And so the Lord is challenging those people who are in exile in a place they don't want to be. He says, be that people of peace, that people of shalom. For in the shalom that you bring to that city, that city will experience shalom and you will experience shalom because the city is also experiencing shalom. Oh, as I, I think about what's going on in our nation now, we need Shalom. We need people to stand up and be those people of peace. You can't help but get. Uh, you can't help but see the the headlines of this past week. The difficulties that our nation is going through. Yes, there's COVID nineteen, but I'm referring to a phone call that I received from a from a young woman who was who was in tears, and her heart was broken. She was grieving because of the situation that happened in, in Minneapolis with the tragic death of George Floyd and, and all the, the outpouring of anguish and, the, and then the, the rioting that's been going on, her heart was broken. And she says, I'm grieving, I'm lamenting, I'm lamenting the loss of life. I'm lamenting the, the, the breakdown, the, the hurt and the pain that's happening and, and that people are expressing. And, and, it, and she just poured it out. And, and it reminded me of the hurt and pain. When I saw, when I witnessed on TV the accounts of that moment, 
it should serve as a challenge for us to pray for our brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ in Minneapolis, that they would be a people of shalom, a people of peace in the midst of those difficult times. But even as we're praying that way, we need to be praying for our own hearts and, and inspecting what's going on in us and our reactions, because in our reactions, it's really telling of where our hearts can be. You know, those subtle prejudgments we make, that, that prejudice that we make when we see something unfolding or we see somebody and we jump to some conclusion. My wife and I, uh, we were um, foster parents to a young man, a, a great guy, uh, and he's a great guy today. Uh, he's a person of color. And it struck me as a challenge when I would sit down with him as a young teenager when he was staying with us and me as a Caucasian trying to explain to him a, a person of color some of the challenges he might face, some of the judgments that might come against him or the simple fact of his color. As a matter of fact, right here in the hallway of church, somebody came up to me once and said, well, do you think he's going to play basketball? And I was struck immediately that just because his skin tone was much darker than mine is, the person just assumed that, well, he's going to be a basketball player. Those subtle ways in which it comes in, we have to be that people of shalom who are looking in our own hearts and, and, and striving to get rid of those thoughts and those prejudices that prevent us from being that person of shalom that's needed in the moment. What Jesus said, listen, you're my disciples. You're salt to this earth. Uh, you are a light in a dark place. You're that city set on a hill. As a matter of fact, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse uh, 16, starting in verse 15, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a lamp and, and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. People of peace are those people who bless, and God calls his people to bless Oh, that is unpacked even more if you were to continue reading through the New Testament. But let me just draw your attention to the fact that we are called to be a people who proclaim. In 1 Peter, he's writing to a church who is experiencing persecution, experiencing difficulty, experiencing challenges. And starting in verse 9, he says this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Did you hear that? We're called to proclaim, that is to shout out what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. For he has taken us from darkness, brought us into his light. We were far away. We were strangers to him. But he's brought us in. He's made us his family. He set upon us a mission. We are the church that gathered assembly wherever we are, called out for God's purpose to fulfill God's mission. Well, we're also called to unity. And Jesus, in John chapter 17, prayed for unity. I believe he was praying for us. When we read in John chapter 17, verse 20, I do not ask for these only, praying for his disciples, 
but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Uh, that would be us. That the disciples would be unified in the message that they share so that it might come down to us and that we would also experience, as he says in verse 21, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus prayed for unity, and that extends to us. And what a challenge that is. What a call that is. Because we can be so easily pulled one way or another in terms of the things that can divide, the opinions and the perspectives that we elevate where we draw lines uh, over matters that really ultimately, if we think about them, don't have eternal consequence. Mask or no mask, red or blue. Oh, we, we allow ourselves to be so wrapped up and so enraged at times in our opinions and our perspectives that it overwhelms that sense of unity. And, and an indicator of that, that if my heart's at that place, that I need to do business with is if that question creeps into my mind and into my thinking, how can a good Christian vote that way, think that way, do that thing? When I think that thought, how can a good Christian, what am I doing? I'm, I'm making a judgment call. I'm assuming that because somebody might do something differently than I do, that's not spelled out in Scripture, that somehow there's something wrong with them. And we do do it, don't we? Oh, just take a look at social media. You can see it there. But all we have to do is think about the thoughts that we think at times and hold them up to the light of Scripture, and hold them up to the prayer that Jesus prayed, that we would be one, as he and the Father are one, and, and in unity, display to the world the reality of the gospel. Display to the world the reality of who Jesus is. You know, if I find myself wrestling with how can somebody feel that way or think that way? What I do is I ask myself a series of questions like, what exactly is the issue at hand? What are my preconceived notions? What are my prejudgments that I'm bringing to the table that somehow might color the way that I'm responding to a person? Where I start to erect a wall or start to erect a barrier that Jesus Christ died and rose on the third day to tear down. We are called to unity. And it's, and it's displayed in the way that we respond to one another. In John chapter 13, Jesus said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I loved you you are also to love one another. By this, will, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That, that commitment to take what God has done in my life and the love that I've experienced through him and allow it to flow through me to impact my brothers and sisters who may have different opinions or different preferences than I do, uh, to my neighbors. And in the way that I respond to my brothers and sisters, that's a testimony of the reality of Jesus Christ to those 
who may be outside of the church, that assembling of, of people who are on mission for God. Oh, is the church essential? Well, yes, the church is essential because we bear testimony to the work of Jesus Christ in our lives. And so we need to pray that the Holy Spirit makes us so Jesus-focused, so heavenly-minded, so gospel-driven that we are earthly good, bringing shalom, wholeness, and the message of, yes, the gospel to the world around us. So is the church essential? Yes, it is. It truly is. Are church services essential? Oh, they sure are. I, I miss you all. And I, I do look forward to that day when we can be together, face-to-face, worshiping and singing and praising and reflecting on the good things that God has done and is doing for us. But until then, it's important to know that just because the doors were closed for that expression of worship, the church has always been open. The church is never shut. For where two or three are gathered together, Jesus is at work amongst them. The church is alive and well. And we have opportunities to explore that. And I'll get to that in just a little minute, uh, in just a moment. But, you know, one of the questions that does come to me, and it's not just a friend asking for a friend, it's just. People saying, yes, hey, when is the church, when are we going to resume our in-person public worship? Well, I'm excited to announce that we are working hard to make June 14th that day in which we'll be gathering together in person. Now, certainly, as we gather together, as we're working towards that, it's going to feel a bit differently as we implement guidelines recommended by the county health department as well as recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control. So we will have informational um, uh, pieces coming out, video and other forms of announcement explaining what this is all going to look like. But even in that environment, it will be so good to be in each other's presence as we are in the presence of our Lord. Because the challenge is that we connect to the body, not to the building. Uh, We have relationship with one another because of Jesus Christ. It's not about the programs. It's not about the ministries. It's not about the buildings. Some ways it's not about me, it's not about you, it's not about us. It's ultimately about our Lord and God. Is church essential? It is. Because God deemed it so essential that he sent his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him can join in that gathering and become a son or become a daughter of God through faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And so I invite you today, if you have not made that faith commitment, would you do that today? Would you say, thank you, Jesus, for dying for me, for rising on that third day, for taking care of my sin, for paying that penalty, for freeing me up, to follow after you. Oh, the opportunities to express what it means to be the church can be found in so many ways. I would encourage you to start a a watch party with people that you know and invite them to come together and worship the Lord together. Maybe you're part of a community group 
Well, as a community group, feel free to gather together and worship the Lord together. And it goes beyond uh, Sunday morning worship times like this. Uh, think about even this morning when we're all done. Think about ways that you, as, the, as that expression of the body of Christ right there, can be a, a body that makes a difference in your neighborhood, in your workplace, uh, wherever God has you at. For God has called us to be a people on mission for him, sharing the good news of Jesus. Now, if you have responded this morning and you said, yes, I want to follow Jesus, please feel free to write. Uh, Feel free to contact the church. We'd love to, the church office, we'd love to get in contact with you and be whatever support we can be. If you have a question, feel free to go to community-church.com forward slash and the staff page, the leadership page, and, and email me and with your questions or, you know, comments. And, and let's engage in dialogue as together we strive to follow Jesus together and bring glory to him and tell the world about the reality of who he is. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning in which we've been able to worship you in song and, and in diving into your word. And yes, we've, we've just barely brushed the surface of who you've called us to be and what you've called us to do in response to your, your love for us. Father, it's my prayer that we would be a people that walk around with eyes wide open, hearts that are soft and responsive to the prompting of your Spirit, hands and feet that are ready to act and, and be that people of peace wherever you call us to be. Certainly, Father, we do want to come alongside our brothers and sisters in the Minneapolis area and, and other cities across the United States this day as they rise up to be a, a people of peace, seeking not just to settle tensions down, but actually address issues and promote equality and justice and express the gospel of Jesus in real terms to their neighborhoods. Oh, Lord, may we be that people who are faithful to hear your voice and follow your call. Lord, be glorified in and through us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been great to have you here this morning at uh, Community Church and uh, trust that you've been blessed by our time together singing and exploring God's Word. Uh, I would encourage you to keep your eye on the inbox of your uh, email and also be checking the church website for updated information about the in-person services that we're looking to start on June 14th. Now, in addition to that, we will continue our live streaming, so that will continue on uh, along with the beginning of in-person public services. Uh, we want to thank you. I want to thank you for your generosity over this period of time. It has been uh, fantastic, and we praise the Lord and thank you for it. If you would like to participate today, you can see the information about how to do that, going to community-church.com forward slash give, or emailing it to 2351 Riff Road in Oshkosh 54904. God bless you. May your week see God's hand at work all week long and shalom.